Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming to our event. Um, the title of our event tonight is There Be Monsters, Race and Gender in the Reception of Siren Myth. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Han Tran. Um, she received a PhD in classics from the University of California at Berkeley, and she taught at the Ohio State University and the University of Oregon before joining the faculty at the University of Miami. Her research interests center on the language of iconography, the reception of classical myth in the art of war periods, and monsters of all stripes. She has published on Scylla and Charybdis, the Sirens, represent representations of mermaids, is preparing a book on the Nereids, and frequently reviews art historical monographs. Um, it's a pleasure to have you tonight, Dr. Tran. Um, over to you. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, so let me just uh, quickly share my PowerPoint. Can everyone see that? Yeah? Wonderful. So um, I was asked to speak about um, my work on the reception of the sirens. And so I think that for this talk, I would lay out first some of the questions that that led me to, to become interested in the sirens in the first place, and then eventually write my article on, on the reception that uh, that's in the Oxford Journal of Classical Reception. And then I'd like to, to spend some of the time to give you a brief overview of the siren through the Middle Ages and then through the modern period and into today's world, okay? So um, clearly this is a vast subject. I uh, don't know how good of a job I'm gonna you know, be able to uh, do in just 30 to 40 minutes, but I'm, I'm gonna try my best. So it's a vast subject. And so you have to be, you have to be fairly selective, right? Um, so my hope is that you're going to enjoy the selection that I've made and that you're going to find it useful and illuminating. So let's start. Uh, how is it that I, I became drawn to, to, to this question, right? To this question of what the siren is? Well, um, it started for me with having to present uh, the sirens in my myth class. And in preparing my notes, I made a number of observations that became questions. And one that, of course, I'm not the only one uh, to, to notice this is this contrast, right? This contrast between the brevity of, of that presentation that actually not uh, that many lines in Homer's Odyssey where, where he talks about the sirens. And yet, um, there's this overwhelming power of their of their uh, of their presence, of their singing, of their song, what the song signifies, um, and then there's this question of uh, are they famous because of the content of their songs, or because of of their singing, the beauty of their voice, right? Um, and I found that found this this contrast difficult to explain. And the more I read, the more the more confusing that that question became. So to, to make the question even more puzzling and, and complicated, um, there is the fact that Homer uh, does not tell us uh, what they look like, nor does he tell us that no one knows what their appearance is. He, he doesn't seem to um, uh, explain um, or draw attention to that in an explicit way, right? Uh, it's it's as if, right? It's as if uh, their very physicality. Um, I don't know if it doesn't matter, but in any case, it's just not. Uh, there's no attention that's drawn to it, right? And which is, you know, if you think about it, it's pretty uh, paradoxical because when we think of of the term siren, right? We have this image of a mermaid, this um, this very enthralling uh, physique, that sort of thing. So. Uh, none of that is present in, in Homer. And, um, and I suspected that this kind of absence, right, this absence of not just bodies, but reference to a body, to some kind of physicality, I suspected that it was as significant as what we do get told in, in Homer. So I set out to, to answer this question. Right. And I started by, by establishing what we do know, right? What, what Homer actually does uh, uh, tell us or not tell us, they don't seem to have bodies. That's the first thing, okay? And they do not have a song that anyone can hear and come home to report on, 
we we sort of hear about what that what they would sing to you, but we you know we don't have like you know like an eyewitness right to tell us um, about the song. And actually, Odysseus is not a good eyewitness, right? Because he does come very close to the island, right? If you read the text carefully. Um, they, they promise him to sing this, this amazing song. We're going to get into the details of the lines in just a second, but he doesn't actually get that, 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 that amazing song that they're promising. Okay, so he's actually not, he's actually not someone who can, can report on that. And so from this basic um, observation of these sort of facts, I, I proceeded to, to make a number of, of, of inferences, right? One is that Homer sirens have nothing that we can hold on to, both literally and figuratively. Um, or rather, uh, there is something we can hold on to. That is one physical thing we can hold on to, and that is that is the rock. And by rock, I mean the island, which is basically a rock. And then something that that's more elusive, right? But that that's sort of inevitable when when you know not just when you read the lines in the Odyssey, but when you consider right their importance in in um, the, the history of what Western culture is the, the lure of the unknown. And, and I might even say here, right, I'm, I'm gonna uh, introduce that, that notion here of, of the other uh, that lies in, in, in what they represent, in what they signify, okay? And so um, I started to focus on the little of what they actually say, the few lines that, that, um, that um, they're reported to, to be saying, to be promising, right? Um, so they promise epic knowledge. That's what they're promising. A uh, very explicit, in fact. Um, but then I asked myself if that was their true appeal, um, not just for the Greeks, right? But also for um, the reason why they continue to exert this, this powerful pull on the imagination. Is it really this epic knowledge they promise him? Um, so in my article, I suggest that, that the appeal lies in the evoking uh, a world outside of epic, uh, which is also to say a world outside of, of the Olympian system that structures ancient Greek epic. And I'm going to get more explicit about that in, in a moment. Um, so some of these clues, and, and there are many of them, to their embodying the an alternative view to the Olympian order are the famous lines that uh, they tell Odysseus, and here they are, right? Um, sorry. We know everything that the Argives and the Trojans suffered by the will of the gods, and we know all that has happened on the bountiful earth. That's what they say. Um, now, this form of epic knowledge in the form of a song makes them, of course, and I think there's, that's a huge point, right? It makes them, of course, explicitly, um, or implicitly, I should say, rivals of the Olympian muses, right? Whose remit is to uh, inspire poets with the same type of knowledge, right? What happened in Troy, right? Uh, what happened in the past, uh, what might happen in the future, that sort of thing. So, so to organize my thoughts around all of these, you know, facts, I, I, I then uh, proceeded to do, sorry, what classicists do, which is to look at etymology, right? What, what's actually available uh, in terms of etymology. And um, turns out, it turns out that the, the name Siren actually seems to have no known Greek etymology or none that we can really agree on. And so uh, the nearest we can get to, you know, getting a sense of what, what, what is, you know, um, uh, encoded in, 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 this, in this name, right, in this name etymologically is to turn uh, to the West Semitic world where you have this term siren, right? That means a bewitching song, how appropriate, right? Uh, or even to, to the Hebrew Eben Hen, right? So you have that, that, that uh, syllable again, Hen, that seems to have to do with, with bewitching, with charm. And so um, I think the best you can say here is that this idea of bewitching is what seems to stand out 
in the putative etymology, whatever that may mean, right, in that, that particular West Semitic or Hebrew context, okay? And then um, I want to see what, what if archaeology should, could shed any light, right, on, on the matter. And of course, it has something to say, right? Um, and our earliest archaeological evidence is, uh, comes from the so-called Orientalizing period, which is roughly, you know, the seventh century BCE, which is when Greece is once again open to, to, the, to the East, the influences uh, from the Near East. And um, during that period of time, which is about a hundred years or so, they start appearing on um, Greek wares and particularly on Corinthian wares. And this is a typical vase from, from Corinth here, uh, typical because of the procession, right, procession of, of animals. And so you see them appearing for the first time, right, on these vases, and there they are, right? And, and they appear as, um, as uh, human-headed birds, human-headed leopards, uh, alongside other so-called fantastic animals, by which I mean the lion, and then you've got griffins or even sphinxes, right? And so she's just one out of many of these uh, hybrids or fantastical creatures, or at any rate, exotic creatures, right? And, um, and it's not just on this type of vase that they appear, but also this type where, you know, their shape, their shape is, is um, now how do, I, I, should, I should address this question, how do we know the siren, right? What, what, what was, because there's, there's no writing here. On some vases, actually, the, the name siren appears next to them, right? The term siren appears next to them. But um, we're gonna get into this question of the correlation between the shape, right? The shape of this uh, uh, human-headed bird, female human-headed bird, and, and the term siren in, in just a moment. But I just want to show you, right, that they do appear in, in the visual arts, um, <clears throat> in a number of contexts, but the question I ask myself is, and that um, you know, scholars of, of ancient art probably do ask themselves as well, is, is this question of uh, whether or not this, this is a, simply a decorative motif, right? Just a visual motif in the same way that a sphinx is a visual motif or a line is a motif, or is there something more to it, right? Is there something more to it? It's, it's a complicated question. I'm not gonna answer all of that today. And maybe that can be part of the questions and answers uh, af afterwards. Um, so here's another example where you have a procession again. And, and so I asked myself, right, is this the beginning of narration, right? When you have the siren proceeding, uh, even in a context as, as, as perhaps, you know, sort of semantically inert as this is, right? Just animals going in a line like that. Um, is there, can we see here the beginning of the plot, right? So again, I'm not gonna really uh, answer this question here, but I just wanted to implant that, that in your mind, right? That, that those are the series of questions I asked myself. Um, and so it's not until, so I said that the, the, the siren as a human headed bird appears in the seventh century in Greece. And it's not until the sixth century, like a century later that in our evidence, our visual evidence, there is uh, an explicit, right, an explicit uh, depiction of Siren in the Odyssey episode. Okay, so you can clearly see here the, the Sirens here again, perch on what appears to be a rock, and then a ship here, right? This is some kind of ship. And then bent over the ship here and there are birds, full birds. And so what I find interesting here is that, um, uh, it's not the sirens who are attacking or preying on uh, the men aboard the ships, but actual birds. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting sort of moment here. Again, I'm not going to explore that fully here with you, but I wanted you to, to be aware of that. It's as if, it's as if with this, of course, I can't say, right? We can't say that this is the very, very first image that, that they produced, right, of this story on vases, but um, as an early example of that, there seems to be this kind of indecision, right, in making the sirens themselves, right, the, the, the attackers, right, the predators on, on this ship full of sailors, okay? 
Uh, but you can see the similarity, of course, between these creatures here and the ones that I've just shown you on, on these other vases. Um, <clears throat> now, once the uh, canonization of sirens as bird lady predator became kind of visually fixed, right, from there onwards, that's going to be, that is going to be how, how the Greeks are going to think visually uh, of the sirens. Um, you get further uh, elaboration, right, on, on the vases, and you have the obvious addition of musical instruments, even though, of course, in Homer, they don't play music, but this is clearly an attempt to, to show that this association with, um, with music, that they are musical. And um, when they do get depicted with musical instruments, so here, of course, a kithara, right, this type of lyre, and um, you have, when there are two of them, right, uh, they play different instruments, right? One plays a kithara, the other one plays, and I'm hoping you can see my mouse moving. Is that the case? Yeah. Um, and the other one is, is playing the, the alros, right? This, this double reed flute type instrument that seems to sound more like an oboe than a flute. Um, and, and what I find interesting here is this attempt to kind of suggest that they form this little band, right? They, they don't all play the same uh, music, but they, they form a, a harmonics, right? And when a third is represented, uh, she's usually without an instrument, seeming to suggest that she's, she's, she's singing, right? She's singing and that they're, they're accompanying her. So uh, another thing that I should, you know, probably address is this idea of the number, right? So in Homer, because of the grammar, we know that he's referring to two, right, to two sirens. Um, but as early as in um, uh, the catalogue of women, which we are dating roughly to the sixth century BCE, we hear of three. There are three of them that are described, uh, and we are even given um, a family tree for these sirens, not in Homer, once again, but it's it's in the cat of women. Whether or not it was composed by Hesiod, that's that's a different question. But uh, they're described as daughters of the river god Achelous, right, and of the local heroine Sterope. And we got we get a further elaboration in this text of, of why they look like that, right? And the explanation, which makes explicit something that uh, is kind of implicit in a way. Uh, even in Homer, and I'll go over that again, is that they uh, offended Aphrodite, right? So they offended her, of course, in the sexual sphere, and that's what that means, of course, by choosing to live as virgins, right? And of course, that's not an option for an ancient Greek girl, right? You cannot choose uh, virginity for life. Um, and as a result of that, they grew wings and they flew to an island that was called Enthemoesa, that means flowery, right? Now, um, what is to me significant in this uh, particular uh, presentation, representation of the sirens of that, that, that episode in the Odyssey is that you have something quite different from what Homer describes once again. And um, the uh, differences between the text and, 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 and images is something that fascinates me personally. I, I do think there's, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what they're each trying to say separately and what they're trying to say maybe collectively. And of course, that's our job, right, to try to sort of um, uh, pull that together. But in any case, so this, this, um, this image here, he's, um, He's actually addressing them. He's communicating with them. He's speaking to them, right? Whereas in the Odyssey, he's completely passive. He's listening to them, and uh, he's not—he's not even described as as seeing them, right? He's not saying, "Oh, they look like this or they look like that," right? He's just hearing them because that's just voices in Homer. Whereas, of course, I mean, you might say that, of course, visual artists have to find some way of representing the sirens, right? You can't just represent sound; it's not really possible. So this is, this is. Um, this, this was their solution, right? Um, so again, that in itself is a whole area of, of, of research, right? The question that's really worth sort of uh, exploring. And um, here I wanted to show you something that probably all of you are familiar with, right? This, this image here of one of the sirens 
uh, jumping off, let's call it the cliff, right? This cliff, uh, presumably to her death, right? Presumably to her death because, well, in Homer, that's not described at all, right? They don't, they don't, they don't die. They don't. There's no, there's no sequel to that, right? They sing their song. They they move away from the island. That's it, right? We don't hear about the sirens after that. But um, so in this vase, if that is what this is alluding to, right? That death, that suicide, so to speak. And in some later literary sources, we find that this version where they they kill themselves by doing just that, right? Jumping off this uh, cliff because uh, they failed to lure, successfully lure Odysseus to, to their island to stop, right? And so because they failed in that, in that, in that uh, goal, they're doing exactly what uh, the Theban Sphinx does, right? When, when um, she fails to, um, to give to Oedipus a riddle that he can't solve because he very famously, of course, solves the riddle of the Sphinx and she too, and of course it's a female, right? She too jumps off a cliff to her death, okay? So I see these two, these two, um, these two versions as, as being very similar, right? I, I, you know, operating very similar in terms of, of, of what they, they signify, right? This, this female, right? This female who, who thought that she had, um, she had this form of knowledge, right? That she could um, uh, manipulate uh, the, this man with fails, right? Fails to, 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 to reveal herself to be this sort of uh, superior being. Um, now, of course, implicit in that in that recognition of, of her failure is is in a way um, uh, this recognition that they are not as good as the muses, right? They can fail, um, and that uh, therefore their brand of epic song is um, is inferior to 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 that of the daughters of, of Zeus and of Nemosune. Now. In the post-classical period, this is actualized as, a contest, as an actual contest between these two groups of singers. And we find reference to this uh, contest in both literary sources, uh, for example, here in Pausanias, right? And uh, in, in the visual arts, right? Or uh, in iconography. And of course, what I'm showing you here is, is um, um, aside from a Roman sarcophagus, right? A Roman sarcophagus from the third century when that was very, very popular, um, showing you, let's see if I can point to that here, showing you the sirens very readily recognizable because of their low half, which is that of a bird, right? And then the muses, right? Who are fully anthropomorphic. Um, now in the Lyric sources, not only do they uh, win this contest, but so they're better than, than the sirens, but they also proceed to humiliate her, right? They're plucking out their feathers, they make crowns for themselves and that sort of thing. Um, and so this, this element of uh, this competition with this Olympian ideal is an important one, I think, to, 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 um, to throw in, in in trying to understand what, what the siren is. Um, and I'm gonna go over that again later on. But the other famous contest, of course, between the Sirens and um, this Olympian order is, sorry, all right, is with Orpheus, right? Orpheus who is, um, he's not a god, of course, he's not a god, but he is, as this exceptional musician, he is uh, as a, as a player of the kithara, uh, very, very close to Apollo, right? Very, very close to Apollo and uh, playing the same type of music that Apollo is playing. And of course, very famously in uh, Apollonius of Rhodes, Argonautica, uh, competing with them, right? Competing with them, drowning that music with his, uh, with his lyre um, in order for the Argonauts not to fall prey to, to, to that beautiful, beautiful song, okay? Now, um, again, here is another example of, of, of how the sirens, I think, the Greek sirens 
uh, to be fully sort of understood uh, need to be, I think, contrasted with this, this, this sort of uh, Olympian ideal. So now I want to jump. I want to jump quickly to the medieval period. So now, you know, we're leaving behind, sorry. Okay. We're leaving behind the classical period and moving on to the medieval period where the siren continues for a time, for a time to be conceived of as a half bird, as you can see here. Um, but there is one new element. Sorry, meant to do this, okay. Um, and that is the, the physical allure, right? She's sort of, she's looking at herself, right? Checking herself out in something that appears to be a mirror here. And so the explicitness of that sexual appear is something that uh, gets gradually more and more explored, but in the medieval period, which I find interesting, right? Not really among the Greeks, but in the medieval period. And uh, during that time, they easily become they easily become um, symbols of temptation and of the devil, right? So here in this excerpt from Ambrose, who was a uh, fourth, century, uh, fourth century bishop of Milan, he is um, saying how uh, you have to you have to listen to Christ, who is the true voice, the true music that you want to be listening to, right? Um, otherwise, if you don't listen to to Christ, then you're just like Odysseus uh, standing on his mast, prey to uh, these 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 voices that can only be temptation, right? If you're not listening to Christ, any other voice is a voice of temptation, basically. Okay. And I think that this very idea of, of temptation is, is, is actually there in the Odyssey, um, where they, they embody uh, the temptation to fall in for an ideal that is not the one approved of by some higher authority, right? So in, for the Greeks, it's that higher authority is, is the Olympian order. Uh, here in this passage, that higher authority, of course, is, is, is Christ or, or the Christian God. And not to do so, not to listen to this approved voice, whether it's that of the muse or that of, of Christ, it, well, can only lead to death, right? And so that's why there's, there's all this, this um, elaboration around death in, in the Homeric Siren. You can see I'm already halfway through. So let me quickly jump to um, the next slide. Um, now, with the next slide, it's only in the early 8th century that we hear of sirens in the written sources having something other than a fishtail. I mean, sorry, other than being, you know, uh, uh, bird monsters. Here for the first time they have a fishtail. And here, again, I, I want to make a separation, right, a division between um, uh, written sources and visual sources, right? In visual sources, they appear with a fish down much earlier than, than in the written sources. So here we're told they deceive sailors with the outstanding beauty of their appearance and the sweetness of their song. Um, and so I think that it's significant that, so here for the first time, so yes, they continue to be these, these wonderful singers, but at the very same time, they are physically, right, very, very attractive. And I think that it's significant that for the first time when we're hearing of the uh, attractiveness of their physicality, their physical bodies, uh, that goes hand in hand with having a fishtail. And, and, um, and I think you can do that more readily than you can do so with, with like bird legs, right? So the fishtail is like slippery, it is smooth, right? This serpentine element that um, is actually a very ancient one. And I'm gonna go over that again in just a few moments. So while this is happening, while, while she starts to acquire a, a fishtail in, in some sources, uh, the tradition of sirens as bird creatures still kind of persevered for, 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 for uh, a while. And uh, so, for example, here in this English bestiary, right, it's as if the, um, uh, the artist could not really decide, you know, between are they birds, you know, with these bird wings, 
and bird legs, or are they fish? You can see here the addition of the fish tail, right? So they're, they're not hybrids, but, but something even more than hybrids, right? They combine three parts. Now, maiden, bird, fish, which one is she? Um, and we have a lot of examples of that. So I'm just gonna few, show you a couple here. Uh, so here she is again with that fish tail and the bird legs, bird wings, and then the fish in her hands. Uh, here again is another one, but I would say that by, well, not just I would say, but our evidence seems to point to the fact that uh, by and large, sirens became half fish mermaids on the whole during the medieval period that's going to be sort of fixed as their iconography from there on. And by fishtail, um, we mean either a single fishtail or, or two of them, so as, as, as is the case here, right? Now, moving on to the modern period, right? So I just want to say some from there onwards, right? The medieval period has fixed the siren as, as a mermaid with a fishtail. And so here, moving forward in time to the 19th century, the end of the 19th century in the work of Arnold Birklin, uh, his depiction of sirens as half bird is actually pretty exceptional, right? Pretty exceptional because he very consciously uh, goes back to goes back to to the ancient Greek concept of of the sirens in depicting them as half birds. Uh, and I just want to say a few more things about his his um, perspective here, and then I have to kind of move on. Um, and that is that this siren here. Uh, is, I think, very deliberately, of course, depicted as physically not a femme fatale. I think you'll agree with that, right? This is not what you picture when you think of a femme fatale. Um, and, and I think that what this is pointing to here for, for um, Arnold Brooklyn is that he is trying to perhaps hint at the hoax, right? That is the sirens of what they promise you, right? They make all these false, prom false promises and it turns out that none of it is true, right? So there's nothing really attractive about these sirens, right? And 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 uh, there seems to be this element of playfulness, right? This this game of death and of course the skulls that, that you already have in Homer uh, is what, you know, you have in, that there's in store for the sailor who comes to close um, lured by, by their music, right? And it's all a game for them. It's all a game for them. And um, while you may say that that's not the case in Homer, um, I think it's not entirely out of the question, right? It's not entirely out of the question. And part of um, the, you know, um, what's really interesting in, in looking at the reception of uh, ancient Greek figures is to see what uh, other cultures, other centuries have done with the same story, with the same figures and, and um, transform these stories, these characters into something that is in some ways, yes, different, but also uh, in a lot of ways, bringing out elements that were actually there in embryo, right? And, but, but that the Greeks themselves did not, were not in a position uh to 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 explicitly stay or state or explore okay so and that that is my you know one of the reasons why i i'm interested in this type of work um so again i'm aware of the time so i'm gonna sort of move forward kind of quickly through some of these slides and i wish i had another hour but um and give you a brief comment on why it is that I chose these particular paintings. This is not this is not explicitly about the siren, but I do think that um, some of the symbolism here uh, that you have uh, encoded in this female is, is is one that is very much part of the siren as we think of her, and the siren as perhaps the Greeks had in mind, perhaps you know unconsciously, right? So this female that lives in this rock or on this rock. Um, this association with the snake, with being, you know, with acting with a snake. So, for example, um, 
in ancient Greek myth, uh, Echidna, right? Echidna is half snake, right? Half snake and, and, and half beautiful maiden who lives under a rock, who's hiding under a rock, that sort of thing. And you have this kind of primal confrontation between man and woman, but the woman is of course clearly, cl clearly, you know, master of the situation. She's about to draw him in into this, this abyss. Um, and uh, this picture here is of a Rusalka, who, uh, who is not a creature of salt water, right? She's, she's a creature of spring water, but um, uh, she's from uh, Eastern, uh, East European culture, Russian culture. And she is, what's interesting here is that so here in red, I highlighted the, the portions of the text I find interesting. She drags you down to the bottom where in all probability she gobbles you up, a real siren, even though she's not a creature of the sea. Um, now, what is Rusaka is in, in these cultures is actually a um, young woman who um, was unhappy in marriage and who took out her own life, right? Who committed suicide. And because of that, she did not fulfill her proper social role, right? And, uh, I, and, and I think that she, in a way it links back to the ancient Greek siren who too stood outside of society, who uh, most definitely did not fulfill her societal role, which was to marry and then produce children. Um, and so this type of woman, right, who does not fulfill what is expected of her by society is in turn, um, eventually turn into this kind of, she's demonized, right? She's demonized as this female figure who, who wants nothing more than to destroy, right? To destroy the man. All right, um, I well, I'll say a few things about this, this image here by, by uh, Fernand Lequen, which is actually from, from a poem uh, that is an adaptation of the story of Hylas. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the ancient Greek Hylas, Hylas was the young lover of Heracles who um, was part of the Argonautica. And uh, he one day went out to fetch some water at a spring and these naiads, naiads of course are these spring water sort of um, nymphs, uh, fell in love with him and kept him, right? They kept him. And so this image here of, of uh, of this musician, and he's a musician here, sort of blends together the, the, the figure of Hylas, who's a victim, and the figure of, of Orpheus, of course, who's not going to be prey to, 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 their, um, to their song, to their music, to their, uh, to, their, to their snare, right? He is going to play his music. He's going to, um, to be able to, to defeat them. So I thought that was an interesting sort of blending of these two ideas, victim, but also, um, master. All right, so these I find uh, very telling and I wish I had, so I'm going to assume that I have about 10 more minutes, is that right? You can stop me if that's not the case. Yep, feel free to like, this is really, really interesting. Don't worry about, don't worry about time. Oh, um, okay. As long as I have time, some questions at the end, don't worry. Okay, wonderful, because I want to spend some time on Gustave Moreau. Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, he is this um, sort of 19th century painter who, is very, who paints things that are very dreamlike. He was very drawn to uh, ancient Greek material. And so he's, he's, he's uh, painted for us three uh, images of the sirens, right? And they're very interestingly uh, separate by quite a gap of time. So this is the earliest one called the sirens. And um, what I find interesting here is that, um, uh, well, so they're not playing music, they're not singing here, they're just making an appeal, right? A physical appeal to, to these sailors. And um, uh, of course the allure here is clearly sexual, right? They're not even wearing any clothes here, right? And you can see, right, that their lower half, so they have nice knees, right? But you can see that the, the bottom of their legs is actually that of a fishtail, right? So that, that's the uh, transformation in siren right there. Um, but what they represent here is, is very explicitly the danger of uh, staying forever in this haunt of Sex, uh, sexual pleasure, and I think we can we can say that, right? Sexual pleasure, and so they represent the danger of giving in to a life that is only about pleasure and nothing else, far away from their home and society. And even though 
right? Homer does not say that. Homer does say, you know, if you listen to that song, you know, you, and of course you, you are a male sailor, right? You are never going to be able to go back to your wife and your children, right? Um, and, and you just fill in the dots here. I think you can fill in the dots even in Homer. And I, I, I and it's interesting to me that Gustav Mohr, we have to wait, right? We have to wait several centuries for that to be made explicit here in the work of this French painter. Now, moving on to his next treatment of the siren. So the difference here, I think, um, is that we have this added element of the blending of the sirens with the earth. You can see here that not only do their lower leg end in that of what looks like a fishtail, but like the coloring, right? The coloring of it makes it seem like that part of the earth. And certainly if you look at their hair, their hair is, um, is it that they have this crown of leaves or are the leaves part of their hair? There seems to be this kind of very smooth blending of, of the sirens with, with nature, right? With nature, which again, is not that far removed from what Homer tells us. Um, and note here, in, in, I find fascinating that there's not even a ship inside, there's certainly no sailors, and, and a theme that I want to sort of begin to bring out here in the reception of the sirens is that it's almost as if, okay, if you have no sailors, no ship, are they, are they relevant, right? Is, can we conceive of the sirens in the absence of, of, of a man who's going to be her victim? Uh, do they make sense any longer? Does it make sense to think of the siren in the absence of, of a male victim? Right? And this is a real question. Um, and I'm going to sort of <clears throat> try to implant in your mind that I find this interesting tension right, in, in looking at all of these various artworks. And that's just a small sample of them. Uh, this tension between the sirens as the, the predators on the one hand and living only to be preying on these poor unsuspecting sailors and on the other end as these sort of autonomous beings as they seem to be here who don't need to have victims who don't need to have men to to exist and to sort of uh, be content and happy to just simply be okay so I do think that 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 is already something that that Gustav Moore is sort of suggesting here whether he, he really knew that that's what he was doing or not this is what I'm reading here and then in a third instance where he does deal with the subject, the poet and the siren here, many years later, as you can see it from 1895, we're almost here in <clears throat> the 19th century. Um, so the poet and the siren, and of course, I think that he means by that the poet has to be Orpheus, right? That has to be uh, the poet that he has in mind. Um, now, this depiction of the two of them, and there's only one siren, by the way, right? Very interesting that we don't... Another thing I want to um, mention here, let me just go back to this one here. Um, another element that I want you to start thinking about is this idea that there is a queen among them, right? There is a queen among them, and that therefore they form kind of like a tribe, right? This little society, right? So even though there are three of them, can we think of them as this kind of separate tribe? Okay, so here we just have one siren, and so there's definitely this duel, right, this conflict, but it's not even a duel, right, because it's very clear the case that she's kind of like a goddess, right, she's kind of like a goddess, and, 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 and Orpheus, or the poet, if you want to, you know, keep him uh, unnamed here, um, is, is, is kind of like her victim, if not a sacrificial victim, like he stands no chance. He's not a match for her. She's so much bigger than, than he is. And, and look at all of the, the red all around them, that red of the corals and the red of his, you know, his cloth here. And of course you're thinking blood, right? And you're thinking sacrificial, sacrificial uh, animal, that sort of thing. Uh, he's just a small child next to, to, this, um, to this siren. Um, so, uh, here what strikes me, uh, as, as perhaps the message of Gustav Moore, again, whether or not he, he thought of this consciously or not, is that, um, by having just one siren and one who's so powerful and, and overwhelming, I think that we're, he's boiling down the idea of siren to, to, to just an idea, you know, there's one siren, uh, because uh, what matters is not, you know, their number, but what they represent, right? What, what it is that we think about when we think of, of sirens, okay? 
So now very quickly again, I apologize for that, uh, for doing it so quickly. I want to bring you to another image uh, that is not explicitly about sirens. She doesn't even have, you know, like a fish tail or anything like that. Um, but um, she, for me, recalls the, the archetype of sirens and note that they all have something in common, all of these various, you know, images that I'm showing you now, is they're all kind of from uh, the 19th century, round about that time, right, when when there, there was in Western culture a real fascination for the femme fatale, right, femme, femme fatale who's, who's associated with water, right, who's associated with water, uh, whether she has a fishtail or not. So this is one of them. And what I find interesting about this depiction is that she's very much self-involved, right? She's not concerned with anything else, anybody else. In fact, she, she's alone. She's alone. And even though she's, you know, for the viewer at any rate, clearly, you know, um, presented as this sexual being, right? She's not surrounded by anybody here in this, in this frame. And uh, there's certainly no males around, no, no victim. And again, there's this question of whether or not he's irrelevant, right? He's irrelevant for thinking about what she is, what she represents. Um, and, uh, and, and this, this kind of insignificance of, of uh, the male victim is, is something that um, I find very interesting. It's almost as if she reminds me in a way of maybe the Venus of Milo, right? To, 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 to invoke another uh, icon here. Um, very much just existing just there. And of course, the Venus of, of Milo is, is, um, is an object for the male gaze, right? She doesn't just stand there, but she stands there as an object for the male gaze. So is that is that something that's still, right, still implied here in this painting, even though, right, we don't have any sort of male victim depicted here? Is that, is that the intended viewership here that, that, that is implied? Um, so here with a sale from John Williams, <clears throat> um, several elements uh, are interesting for me here. This, this idea of the sirens as, as, as a tribe, right? As a tribe. And uh, they've now multiplied, right? Oh, not just not two, not three, but you know, like quite a number of them. And they're all by themselves. They just live on this rock. So again, the rock, the island, you know, however you want to call that 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 piece of earth that they live on. And and I find that interesting how it juts out very aggressively into the sea, almost in a phallic way. And um, uh, there's nothing on this rock, right? So again, this barrenness, right, that you already find in, in Homer, the barrenness of the island. And um, the title, a sail, is interesting because, yes, you can kind of see a sail here in a far distance, right? Um, and there's a suggestion that uh, their the whole existence is to look out for a, a sailing ship, right? That, that's, that's why they're around, right? You have these victims, right, that, that common sailing boat. Um, and yet, right, uh, despite the fact that there's one of them who's seemingly waving in the ship or whatever it else, everybody else is kind of just um, quite content to just laze about, you know, taking some sun, bathing the sun, just playing with water and, and just happy to be in general, right? So here, uh, this painting is interesting because I think it does illustrate this tension that I've, you know, so ask you to, to be thinking about this tension between the existence being wholly predicated on being predators and, and on the other hand, uh, being these autonomous beings who don't need to have victims to, to be and justify their existence. And then, um, still looking at the time here, uh, in the swim, so note again here the date, uh, yes, now we left a uh, 19th century, we are here in the early part of the 20th century, but that, that theme, right, of the femme fatale continues. And here we're looking at a, um, a woman who, uh, you know, all we have of her, of course, is, is a perfectly coiffed hair, right, just looks perfect. And if it were not for the fact that the rest of her body is in water, right, she seems to be this, this woman of, uh, from respectable society. 
but clearly the fact that she's in the water and smiling uh, slyly at this pair of hands that are clearly indicating that this person is drowning, right? Um, and I think it suggests, it seems to be suggesting that even uh, respectable women are like that. They are potentially as deadly as an actual siren, right? So this fear, right, and, and, and that, that, um, that, um, that in every woman, right, even a respectable one, there, there is potentially a siren. All right, so here again, going through my catalog of, of femme fatale, uh, we're going back to uh, what are more explicitly sirens, of course, uh, here uh, luring Odysseus and his, uh, his crew. Uh, what I find interesting in this image is the fact that, uh, well, on the one hand, you know, if you look at the way that their bodies are depicted, they're very similar to the men. They're very muscular. They're very strong. They even have the same coloring, the same tint, right? Um, they're kind of like the equal of these men physically, at any rate. And um, draw your attention to these strings here that draw attention to the fact that, you know, that they're, they're playing music, right? That they're, they're luring them maybe with some form of music. But also at the same time, you can see here the prominence of of the red poppies and of course red poppies right what do we think about when we think of red poppies not just we in the modern period but of course the greeks themselves symbols of death of course symbols of, of sleep that that is um eternal sleep right oblivion um so these two things that that um that the embody right that that the, the uh, the pleasure, right? Whether it's through music, song, or or sexual pleasure, and but at the same time that that comes with with death, right? Okay, so here moving on quite fast. This is not one of the more um, important paintings, but I just want to mention it here. Uh, this is from a German painter. Uh, so here we're talking about a country that is, you know, mostly landlocked. Yes, there's a bit in the north that is not landlocked, but basically Germany is, is very landlocked. And so um, artists there would naturally, I think, interpret the siren as, 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 as a female who inhabits not the sea, but rivers, woodland, ponds, um, here that part snakes, right? And uh, maybe you can just fill in for me that they seem once again to be quite happy, very self-satisfied, you might even say, not just happy to be, but pretty self-satisfied, self-satisfied, blissfully uh, content with their condition, just being what they are in nature uh, without needing any kind of external uh, approval or, 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 or to be appealing to the external world in, in, in any way, right? Self-sufficient and also self-defining. And now, <clears throat> uh, this image here by um, Gustave Mosa, the satiated siren, right? Where she's uh, this vampirish type of bird of prey. Uh, you can connect her right back to, to the ancient Greek sirens here and, and, and look at her huge clawed foot here, uh, all given to snatch victims. And what I find fascinating about this painting is that if you look at the islands, right, and if you look carefully, you want to see that the islands are actually buildings, you know, these massive buildings that you associate, of course, with civilization, the highest form of civilization. You have temples and city halls and things like that. And um, and is the island that she stands on, is the island she stands on actually and you know a shipwreck building, a drowning building. Um, and so here she's the siren is not just after men, but she's after their whole world. She's after civilization itself, which again I'm going to say is not that far off of what Homer in a way saying, right? By threatening the man, right? The male uh, head of the household, you are threatening civilization itself, right? If he can't go back to his household to be a father, a husband, that sort of thing, then civilization crumbles, right? Okay. Um, then I want to, again, quickly evoke the world, uh, the, the work of another French painter who specialized in, and really the term specializing is appropriate here, specialized in uh, depicting, I'm going to say sirens slash nereids. And nereids are 
of course, another figure that I'm, I'm, I'm working on currently, the Nereids are, I want to say, proper Olympian goddesses in the sense that they are anthropomorphic, right? They don't have some strange fish tail or strange bird legs. Uh, yes, they live in the sea, but they are fully anthropomorphic and they do represent the, the order of, the Olympian order of Zeus. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can ask me in the uh, questions and uh, afterwards. But um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Adolf Lalire is that he is blending these two, these two paradigms, right? The proper Olympian uh, goddess who lives in the sea, right? Who, who looks normal, right? That there's nothing wrong with her appearance. And, and then the sirens, right? The sirens who are uh, these more sort of dubious character, right? Who are sometimes, you know, uh, with, with animal features. And so here I want to, to bring up for you uh, what images of what the ancient Nereid looks like, right? Just so you can see she's really fully um, anthropomorphic, right? Um, but a significant uh, feature of the Nereid is that she's riding, she's riding, whether she's riding fish, dolphins, or hybrid creatures, fantastic hybrid creatures in the sea. Uh, something that I do talk about in this, in this book that I'm, that I'm working on is that they don't seem to be able to move on their own in the ocean. They always seem to need some sort of form of transportation, even though they are born in the sea, which I find really, really interesting, right? So um, the blending here of the siren with with uh, Neri, because here you see she's clearly riding this 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 fish, right? Is an interesting one because um, even for the Greeks, right? The Greeks really try to compartmentalize these two paradigms, right? Really try to keep them separate, right? No, no, no. We're going to depict our our Neri our, our, as very um, proper and 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 if you if you want to say well this one doesn't look very proper right she's not wearing any clothes um, this is a Roman version right the Romans and again this this is a subject for a whole other talk but the Romans have have less uh, fewer scruples right in depicting the Nereids as as these sexual beings than the Greeks did right the Greeks really insist on having them fully clothed. But in any case, so uh, Adolf Lali, of course, who is from a different culture, uh, from a different time period, does not have such scruples, right? He is readily blending in uh, something that, uh, of course, the human mind wants to do, right? He wants to blend in all of these really alluring females who live in the sea as just this one being, right? They are one person, right? And so he does still evoke the sirens here with the musical instruments and then evokes the narrative here with not just the fact that they're writing, you know, this fish, but the fact that um, they have this uh, motif, right, that you see in um, uh, Greek iconography, but also Roman iconography that where you have this veil, right, this veil that draws attention to uh, the, the figure, whether she's male or female. And that's something that's associated with, with the narrative, it's not, not the sirens. And then another painting by, by Lalir here on the left-hand side, where uh, there is this really explicit uh, association between this female creature who spends a lot of her time in the sea with the earth, with, with primal nature and that sort of thing. Again, a step that the Greeks themselves did not, did not take, okay? All right, and this is actually one of my favorite uh, representations, and, and, and I hope you don't mind if I take the time to, to comment on this. This is from 2016, so we're very much into today's world. This is from an artist from LA, Jessica Williams, um, and this is a very small painting, almost a drawing in terms of its size. Uh, so this is really uh, interesting, not just because it's really the only artwork that I'm showing you that's actually by a, a woman, okay? Every other artwork that I'm showing you is by, well, except for the ones that are coming up, right? The ones that are coming up uh, by a, a female, female artist. And what I find interesting here is this, um, if you look closely, you could see an arm here. And I think was, what is being suggested here is that the rock, the island that, that, that the siren inhabits is here acting as a mirror, right? Because she, she, she can see her arm, she can see her reflection. And that she's kind of looking at herself. There's this kind of self-introspection that I find really interesting in this image 
she's looking away from the viewer. She's not interested in the viewer. Um, and therefore also not interested in sailors. She's not interested in the external world. It's all about her. It's all about her um, retreating, retreating from society. Uh, it's a retreat that's not a threat to society, but it's a retreat uh, for as a form of better self-knowledge in a way, right? And, and that's definitely not something that we have seen uh, really that explicitly with any other work, okay? And also, of course, the paradox of the title song of the siren, she's not singing here, uh, not, not clear that she's interested in singing. And, and the point is not that she's singing, but the point is that she just is, right? Um, using the uh, verb to be, uh, the existential use of the verb to be, right? She just exists. All right, and then very quickly uh, with the next one, we return to um, the siren as a threat, right? As a threat to not just man, but also as a threat to society here, okay? And I'll just very quickly draw your attention to uh, the fact that these kind of indecent line of uh, that they're creating here, the sirens, right? This avenue that they're creating with their half naked bodies, right? Seem to sort of converge with the line that the Parthenon here is, is sort of creating in terms of the perspective, right? Of the viewer. And um, uh, so I wanna maybe suggest a way of reading this as um, the, the sirens perhaps competing, right? Competing with the order of the civil eyes uh, as they are being this kind of objects for the male gaze, obviously, right? Uh, but also kind of like self-involved, not really concerned with anything other than just themselves, right? They're looking ahead, but also kind of like lost in their, in their own thoughts. So in the last few minutes that I have, I wanna to get to, um, the works that I do discuss in my in my article and that um, are kind of central to what I'm trying to say. Uh, this is um, a work by by Carrie Moyer, who in, in in 2016 did a whole series on the sirens. So they're going to have various names, right? This one is Intergalactic Emotive Factory, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have different names, but they're all part of the series, the sirens. And here, um, I want to draw your attention to this black rock, which of course I think, you know, evokes the black island of, of the sirens, black as in barren, nothing grows on it. Um, but while this is, you know, this black island, this black rock, what I find interesting here in this depiction is these very lush colors, right? Uh, yes, red as in passion, as in blood, but also blending in ever so subtly into the blue that is the blue of hope, the blue of dreams, the blue of the ethereal, this promise that they give you. And then of course the sparkles and the glimmers that uh, this, 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 um, evocation of this other more fantastic world that is very much part of, of, of uh, um, the siren as, 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 uh, as far back as, as you go back to. All right, so here is the work that I spend most of my article discussing because I think that what this artist, Rachel Harrison, she's an American artist who is based in, in New York, um, this work is called Siren Serenade. And it's not just the title of the work, but it's actually the title of this vinyl record that you can see here that's, that's sort of encased in this black rock that's made of polystyrene actually. Um, the reason why I spent a lot of time uh, discussing this artwork is that as contemporary as it is and as unusual as it may be, as, and it is an unusual dis descriptor of, of the sirens and of the island, I do think that it's actually quite on point, quite on point and in some ways closer to what Homer is sort of saying in, in not so many words in his, uh, in his Odyssey. Um, so the, the black island, right, this black rock, which is all we know of the sirens, all that we can really see is an island uh, that is kind of self-sufficient, right, just standing there in the middle of the sea. And yes, we don't, we don't know of what they look like, right, in Homer. So there are no, no sirens here, not even uh, a hint of, of bodies, of, 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 of persons living on this island. And so all we have really are two things. Uh, yes, we do have the rock. And then we have this, this, this um, 
this record, right, this vinyl record that's, and of course, I don't need to tell you that this is um, a pretty old technology, in some ways, obsolete technology, right? It's uh, not going to work on your on your on your computer. Uh, you have to get a special turn turntable for that to listen to it. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that there's no turntable, right? There is no record player. So what good is a record if there's no record player to play it, right? You can't hear it. And before I get into the symbolism of that and what I think that means. Um, the title of this work comes from the title of the vinyl record, which is Siren Serenade. And that's not the only reason why, right? Uh, the, I think she gave the, uh, this, this work this title. Um, if you do have a turn uh, table and you are able to listen to this record, it's actually the piece of music that it is, is light jazz, right? Light jazz. And the reason why I think this is significant is that that is probably the last thing you want to think about when you think about the sirens in the Odyssey, right? The sirens in the Odyssey are very sinister. There are these very ominous sort of um, presences. And that to me stands at the opposite pole of what, you know, this music actually is, right? Light jazz. And, but once again, I do think that this idea that there's this, uh, that they're all this false promise, right? What you get is actually the opposite of what you might expect, um, is, is really quite well played out here in, in, in this uh, choice, right, of this vinyl record. And so they promise you a lot of things, right? But you're never gonna hear that song, right? They keep promising you this song and you're not gonna hear it because, uh, well, maybe there's no bodies to actually play the song, to sing the song, or because you're going to crash and, and, and die before that, or just, just gonna be dead before you hear the song. But in case, you're not going to hear the song. Um, and then of course, this huge, huge satellite dish, right? That is one of the most prominent, the most prominent feature of this rock. Um, and I don't need to tell you that satellite dishes, I are by and large in our society anyway, uh, chiefly used not as a form of sending out information, but more as a way of receiving information, right? Which uh, at first glance may seem to be quite inappropriate for the sirens because they're all about telling you things, right? Uh, broadcasting over the waves that they have this wonderful song to sing you. So what is the point of the satellite dish? Um, and I think that that's, 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 that's really, really clever if, if that's what, you know, uh, Rachel Harrison had in mind. For me, right, the satellite dish is all about, it's like this huge ear, right? It's this huge ear that is all about waiting to hear, waiting to listen. And what are the sirens listening to if that's what they are, right? If that's what they are, the satellite dish, they are waiting to hear the noise, the presence of their next victim which is precisely where the sirens are in Homer, right? They are there to, to, to victimize these, these male sailors. And so here I think there, uh, what Rachel Harrison has done is, is, is very much capturing um, the, the essence of, of, um, uh, of Homer's sirens. And um, I find it interesting, right? I find it interesting from sort of a humanistic perspective that perhaps one had to wait all of these centuries to, to be able to, to state that explicitly. This is what Homer is really trying to say, right? This is what Homer is really trying to say, um, and um, uh, but not either being able to or, or, or daring to, to state that, right? In, 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 um, in that form. Now, I'm aware that we are right up against time and I just wanted to say a few more words about Clara Moyer before I hand over the microphone to, to this very, very patient audience is just to say a few words about Clara Moyer's um, Siren series, which I'm sort of thinking about working on, um, is uh, here I want to draw your attention to, okay, so we have roughly three sirens, but when I say three sirens, of course, this is an approximation because they don't have a face. Yes, they remind you perhaps of the cyclonic figures, right, that uh, you, you may know about, right? Uh, they don't have a face, no identities, because that, that doesn't really matter, right? That doesn't really matter. They don't need a name to exist, right? They don't need to be pigeonholed to, to exist. And um, it's, it's kind of like formless, 
roughly female figures, right? You can see the curve here, right? That alludes to the female. And um, uh, while, you know, you start off at the bottom with something that looks kind of blackish, right? And green, the green of nature, that very quickly evolves into something that is, you know, bluish, um, the form of hope, the color of hope into something that is white and, and divine. And, and here again, that that's what their appeal is, right? They start from the earth, right? They start from something that is seemingly unpromising, but perhaps what they evoke, what they're promising is maybe not a false promise. Maybe that their the real uh, gift to, to perhaps even Odysseus himself and, and to, to us, right, to culture is, is the evocation of a different world, which I think at the end of the day is what the sirens um, are promising both in Homer and subsequently. They're promising this other world. And if they are at times and often associated with death is that um, daring to enter this other world can, can be a very frightening proposition that you can often equate to death, right? And, and death to the old self, to the old way of, of, of knowing things. All right, so there are many, many more things I could say, but roughly that is, um, that is uh, the, the essence of what I would say about her other uh, works in the same series. All right, so uh, you've been very, very patient. So I, I wanna be able to turn the microphone back to you and see if uh, you have any questions uh, about any of what I just said. And thanking you, of course. I know, thank you so much for that presentation. That was, um so much fascinating material in that. Um, so thanks very much on behalf of everyone here to Dr. Tran. Um, so as usual, um, if you could put questions in the chat um, and I'll, I'll make my way through them. We only have about 15 minutes left, um, but we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, I guess actually like my, I had a question um, going back to the Iliad quote that you had and then the Argonautica quote. Um, so it was really interesting to me um, the comparison that you mentioned between the Olympian muses, um, who are like really, really, um, obviously really significant figures in Greek poetry, um, and how the sirens are also really well versed in epic. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, was it something like, um, they have the same knowledge or something, like they have, they're really well versed in it. Um, and then the fact that yeah, I don't know, like to me, like um, knowledge of epic song was so highly esteemed that kind of um, they're just viewed as dangerous figures. And then also in comparison to um, Orpheus, who, and this is maybe this is just my own ignorance, um, but I've never conceived of Orpheus necessarily as an epic figure. And the fact that he's able to, um, well, from that passage, it looks like pretty easily overcome these figures who are you know like compared to the muses right they're defeated by that they're, they're not they're defeated by the muses i think you said in the pausanias but yeah you know, yeah the, so your question is on um what what are you wondering about exactly yeah i guess it's just sort of um, so it's not a very well formed question i've kind of rambled a bit but um i sort of just I'm wondering why they're so, like they're not, they don't, there's not, doesn't seem to be that much made of um, them and their song. And then especially like in the later depictions that you mentioned, um, how it turns to also like appearance from something that originally had no physical form. Yeah, so you're saying it's curious that that we don't, we're not taught uh, that much about whether the sirens actually sing, is that what you're asking? Yeah, but like the sort of content and yeah, I guess. 
Yeah, we, we're not told very much, but it's almost as if we're told the essential, which is that they make it very clear. Okay, so we know about the past, we know about the present, we know about the future, we know everything that happens on this earth, right? And, and it doesn't get any bigger than that, right? I mean, what else can you ask them for, right? It, this, is, this is the whole truth. Um, and, and that's what the muses tell, right? That's what they tell you, right? We're, we're gonna tell you what happened at Troy, you know, just listen to us, right? And so the source of knowledge about all of these things is through the muses. Um, whereas the thing that is threatening about uh, the sirens uh, from that angle is that they are proposing the same kind of knowledge, except it's not, it's not through the muses. And the thing that's threatening about that is that the Olympian system is very much about you know, there's one way of doing things, and there are specific people who do specific things, right? And 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 it's also the fact that the muses have a clear family, and their fa their dad is Zeus, their mom is Mnemosyne, memory, right? Which is what the the poet is supposed to have. He's supposed to have memory. He's supposed to practice things. Uh, but the, the 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 sirens are threatening because they stand outside of that. Right, so it's very hard to make sense of. Um, so, what system are you part of? Right? Do you do you inspire poets as well? Um, and and of course, you don't hear Homer uh, mentioning that. But that's the threat. That surely must be the threat, right? Um, that that they can be that form of competition. But of course, the the the, the sirens are not. Uh, they're confined to the island, right? They, they, the most that they can propose is 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 it, it to the next victim, right? To, the, the, you know, to 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 tell them that that sort of thing. So they don't they don't participate, right? The, the thing that that's um, uh, threatening, disruptive about the sirens here is I mean, there are many other things that are threatening about her about them, but that's you know, uh, given your question is the fact that they are uh, in a way implicitly offering this alternative system of passing on knowledge because epic knowledge is all knowledge for Homer, right? If you, if you know, you know, if you know what uh, what the gods say to each other and, and what happened at Troy, why you know everything that's worth knowing essentially. Um, and, and also, uh, I don't know if that's part of your question, but this is what I would add, and this is what I talk about in my article. Um, the reason why you want to protect, right? You want to protect the muses' knowledge and their uh, uh, and that realm, right, of endeavor is that uh, epic songs, epic, is what gives you immortality. Right. If you've one of these heroes there, this is what gives you immortality because you're not going to find immortality in the underworld, right? You just rot there like a shade, right? Nobody hears about you. So the only way that you live on, the only way that you live a trace of yourself is through these epic songs. And, um, uh, and, and, and we can't, the, as long as you subscribe to this worldview, right, that 99.9% .9 of us end up in the underworld, right, and the only form of, of immortality we get is through, you know, our mentioning epic songs, um, if you subscribe to that, so what is it that the sirens are offering you, right, uh, because they're not just saying, oh, we're going to, yes, they're explicitly saying, oh, we're going to tell you everything you want to know, we're going to give you all the knowledge that you're longing to hear, but also implicitly, and that's the part that, that's, that's, that's more tricky, but that's very much there, is they're offering something else. By, by telling him, look, um, all you need to do is stop here, you know, stop your ship and, and, and you're gonna see this is gonna be wonderful. I think um, there's this idea, there's this suggestion that we're going to, uh, introduce you to a world outside of epic, right? Which is basically what I, you know, what I keep arguing that, and, and what is, and, and for the, the person who subscribes to his worldview, right? To the Homeric worldview is, what is that? What is that world outside of epic? Is there even a world outside of epic? And that is what's so dangerous about the sirens. And that's why uh, that, 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 that sort of implied contest with the muses is, is, is always one in which and of course, that's not one that, that is discussed in Homer, but later on, right, where they do discuss it, it's always one in which they have to be the losers, 
right? Because otherwise, if, if the Sirens win, that means that worldview wins and therefore the Olympian world um, no longer has a reason for being. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that was really, really fascinating actually. Um, especially because I think, well, maybe just my personal experience, we always focus on like, um, you know, the Homeric side of things and the fact that this, this possibility exists is a really, really interesting one. Um, so thanks so much for answering my question. Um, so Liz Burgess has a question in the chat. Um, Liz, do you want to come up and ask it yourself or I can read out for you? Okay, um, so Liz says, um, hi, thank you for such a great talk. You talked a little bit about the differences between the, between the naiads and the sirens. Can you talk a bit about the differences between sirens and harpies? Sirens are harpies, yes, I'd be happy to do that. So they're both birds of prey, clearly. Uh, the interesting thing about the harpies is that um, the way in which they are similar is that they're, um, they, they're thought of as, as monsters, right? They're, they're not like the nice proper female, right? They, they're, they're predators. But the thing about the harpies to the extent that we know anything about them is that the most prominent episode where they appear, of course, is, is in the Argonautica, right? where they um where their job because they have a job to do is to plague this poor old man by the name of Phineas um why the gods actually uh, are requesting that of the harpies so in a way the harpies are working for the gods and that's that's to me that is the significant difference between the sirens and the harpies because even though they look they both look monstrous right when when they are depicted in in the visual arts uh the harpies work on behalf of the olympians by punishing phineas this old man uh this blind old man by 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 making by baking his food uh, inedible, right? That's a that's job because he revealed too much, right? He's a seer, Phineas is a seer. And of course, seers have, have this problem that they, they tell us too much, right? Too much of, of what they do know. And so um, the harpies there uh, work as, as agents, right? Agents of the Olympians. Um, but there are other places where, you know, the fact that they are these strange, you know, hybrid beings, right, that this threatening female does come through, right, more clearly. And that is the, in the contest with the Boreades, right, the sons of Boreas, the, the, the north wind, right, where they, of course, they're very fast, right, that's that, that's fast as winds, and they themselves are sons of winds. And so there's this contest, right, that in which uh, it's a it's a race basically like who's the fastest and and the boreades are uh, going after them they're chasing after them because and that's actually part of the same story as as the story with Phineas right they're trying to protect this poor old man right and so they're going after them and um, and of course you can't myth is not going to really uh, have a winner right between these two these two entities that are equally fast and. Um, so it, 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 it ends in a stalemate, right? Where they, they end up just, just falling out of exhaustion and dying from the exhaustion, right? But the harpies, I mean, if we have time to, to talk about them some more, have this interesting genealogy that they are sisters of the rainbow, Iris, right? And we know Iris as the messenger of the gods in the Iliad. She's very much a positive figure. And what I find interesting about their, their, their family tree is that, um, uh, so their, their father is Thaumas, right? Wonder, and the, and the mother is Electra, who's, who's a daughter of ocean. And here again, you have this connection with the sea, right? Uh, even though they're bird creatures, you have this connection with the sea. So all these strange female entities coming from the sea. Here you have it again. Um, but again, the, the fact that um, Iris, that positive Olympian Iris is a sister, is, is a good place to, to, to look for um, this kind of tight line, fine line that, 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 uh, that there is between treating a creature as fantastic or as monstrous. So you could say that Iris is this fantastic creature, the rainbow, whereas the harpies are these monstrous creatures, but they are, you know, like they're sisters, like they're sisters. And, um, you know, of course they're sisters because they're, 
that fast. Like the rainbow is, you know, if you don't think of the rainbow as moving, right? It doesn't physically move, but I don't know if you ever tried to catch up with a rainbow. You can't, right? Because it's always like retreating. So in a way it is fast and it's faster than you ever are going to be. So I, you know, this is, uh, is that answering your question, uh, Liz? Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I think it's really interesting how like, sirens have all this knowledge and they sing about it and then the harpies are sort of agents of silence for people who have said too much that's that's really great yeah yeah that, that that's that's nicely put actually that's nicely put um but only because they're working for the olympians right right exactly Live on their own yeah exactly right okay well thank you sure um it looks like we don't have any other questions? Um, and we're reaching the end of our time. So I guess all I have left to say is another big thank you to Dr. Tran for this presentation, um, which took us from ancient Greece all the way to 2015. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Tran, for um, speaking for us tonight. Um, the final in our series, um, Classics Reconnected, will be um, at this time next week. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and yeah, have a very good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. All right, thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.